How many are glad that uh, it's going to be over 40 degrees today without like the howling winds? Man, I am glad. Hey, I love to have fun uh, all the time, and I think Sundays shouldn't be an exclusion of that. So uh, could I have my six volunteers? I've asked one volunteer from each section to come. Could you guys come up right now if I ask you, I talk to you? Come on up. We're going to play a game. Come on up, Anthony. Come on. Come on, Kim. Challenge. Hey, okay, so we are going to play a game, and there are high stakes at odds. You guys want to hear the price? Okay, so uh, come on up on the platform, guys. There, uh, these six, we're going to play reverse Christmas charades, and these six are representing your section. So over here in uh, church number one is Charlie. So Charlie is your, so you guys have got him right here in church number two. What's your name? Abby. Abby is church number two. Church number three, right here, my man, Anthony. Give it up for Anthony. Church number four, right here, John, John Lipovac. Church number five, Kim. Hey, church number five, you're awake. Hey, and church number six, Challen. Woo, okay. So here's what you guys are playing for, okay? Uh, I'll, I'll explain the game, then I'll tell you what the prize is, okay? Um, these six up here are going to be guessing. They're going to close their eyes, look at the ground, and up on the screen, we're going to show you a Christmas charade card. And everybody in the pews are going to be acting it out, okay? So you guys want to act it out really good, and then it's going to be a race. They're going to have their eyes closed. Uh, then then uh, you guys are going to... Um, uh, be acting it out, and it's going to be a race. Whoever, whichever section guesses first wins. Drum roll, please. Chick Fil A for the entire section. Not even kidding. Okay. So Dave Grimm hooked me up. You guys don't think I'm. You guys think I'm lying about Chick Fil A? We just start throwing some. I didn't even make it. Those are flimsy cards, man. Hey, go ahead, get it. Okay, we've got Chick Fil A. Before I forget, for guys volunteering, you guys get some Chick Fil A. All right, go ahead and close your eyes up here as, as soon as I uh, pass that out. Thank you guys for volunteering. Close your eyes up here. Okay, look at the ground and go ahead. Um, nobody can see anything. Nope, we're good. Okay, all right. So now everybody over here, it, you guys got that? Did you guys get it? Do you guys need to see it again? Okay, open up your eyes and on the count of three, the congregation is going to act it out and first one to guess it out. Ready? One, two, three, go. Oh, this is a practice round. Tom, Bing, right, right here. Charlie. All right, so that was, that was the practice round. We've got, we've got one more practice round. You, you know what? As surprising, you guys, you guys keep on guessing. Just start flowing with it, okay? That was a practice round. Let's do one more practice round. How many thinks your, your uh, guesser needs some encouragement and some more? Come on, okay? All right, okay? Either that or, or you guys are uh, really bad actors. I'm not sure. I've got my back to you. So close your eyes. This is practice round number two, and then we'll go with the real one, okay? So close your eyes. Nobody can see anything. All right, go ahead and throw that up. All right, this is practice round number two. All right, ready, set, go. Uh, church people. Shoot me uh, Shoot me Christmas tree. Um, a star. All right, Challen. Challen got it. It was decorating a Christmas tree. No wrong answer, guys. Guess as much as you want. Okay. Here is the round. This is for Chick-fil-A for everybody in the section, okay? Chick-fil-A, okay? You guys got it? Abby, you got a guess, girl. Come on, you got this. You got this, Anthony. This is, this is for the Christian chicken, okay? So close your eyes, look down. This is for the goods. This is for the goods, okay? Go ahead and show it. All right. Hey, and let me remind you, let me remind you, no talking, no humming, no vocals, nothing, okay? Ready, set, go. <laughs> Boom, right here, right here, right here. Grandma, we've got grandmas on the floor. 
<laughs> Grandma's down. <laughs> Grandma's down. <laughs> hey, Marsha, Marsha, you and Doug get gift cards just for that. That was worth it. Man, for your whole family, sure. Why not? For your whole family. There you go. Okay. All right. Give it up for Charlie. Your section. Good job, guys. I'll get you cards here. Good job, Anthony. All right. Pastor Brian's got some goods. And uh, so you pass those around. Church section one. I knew you guys had it in you. That's, that's good. Hey, thank, thank you, David Grimm. He's the operator at uh, University, which I think is the only Chick-fil-A in the Des Moines area that I go to. Um, and uh, he gave us all those cards, and what a blessing that is. Um, so thank you so much. That was a lot of fun. How many uh, had, had a good time with that? That was, that's pretty good, okay? You know what? It pays to come to church. I pay in Christian Chicken. That's what I'm saying. So uh, this morning, our text, we're going to be looking from, I can't believe that Marsha rolled around <laughs> up on, on the, <laughs> we're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1, the title of my message this morning is Joseph, a righteous man. Now the Bible doesn't have a lot to say about uh, the earthly father of Jesus, Joseph, but what it does have to say is very convicting. He was a, a righteous man, and as I was preparing this message, um, I just had a lot of um, just kind of checks in my spirit from the Holy Spirit as, as, uh, as I was preparing it. You know, there's things in my life um, that I was feeling convicted about. And I can do one of two things from conviction. I can, I can either run from it and, and just try to push it away and ignore it, or ca I can allow that conviction from the Holy Spirit to, to motivate me and to allow the Spirit to come and change me and shape me and mold me into who God wants me to be. And whether you're a mom this morning, a dad, you're divorced, you're single, you're young, you're old, you're an aunt, you're an uncle, no matter where you're at in life, God is speaking to you this morning, and the Holy Spirit doesn't just bring conviction, it brings a power so that you can live victorious and you can leave here living a righteous life by the power of Jesus Christ and his Holy Spirit. So we're going to start reading in Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. I'm going to be following along on the screens. This is how the birth of the Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to dis divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary, as, Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son. And he gave him the name Jesus. Now, uh, chapter two, Pastor Jeff talked about that last week. I'll kind of summarize that right now. The wise men um, uh, travel from the east. They, they met with Herod, and Herod had all this crazy uh, plan to try to kill Jesus. And uh, so the wise men went. They, they worshiped Jesus, and then through a dream, they eluded Herod, and Herod was upset and everything. If you didn't hear that message, you need to listen to that on our website. Um, and so we'll pick up in verse 13. This is after the wise men had um, appeared to Jesus and worshipped him, and they were on their way. So when they had gone, when the, the Magi had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious, and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time that he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. 
a voice is heard in Rama weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, get up, take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel for those who are trying to take the child's life are dead. So he got up, he took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus uh, was reigning in Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee and he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So was fulfilled what was said through the prophets that he would be called a Nazarene. Would you pray with me this morning? Heavenly Father, we ask that this morning your Holy Spirit would speak to us. You'd open up our ears. You'd open up our eyes to see and hear the things that you want us to hear this morning. I pray that this morning would not just be uh, an intake of information, but God, that it would be an intake of your Spirit that enables us to change and, and to become more of the man or woman of God that you want us and you've called us to be. So let your word quicken this morning and speak through me what you want. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. All right. So uh, Joseph was a great example of, of what a righteous person uh, looks like. And this morning I'm going to give you four aspects of Joseph's life um, that are, are very noteworthy, and, and, uh, but they all point to something greater. You know, Joseph is a great place to look initially as far as living a righteous life, but his life pointed to Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ lived a righteous life, and he demonstrated all four of these attributes in a perfect demonstration. So the first thing that scripture reveals to us in this text is that righteous people don't publicly expose sin. Verse 19 says, because Joseph was a righteous man, in this it says he was faithful to the law, but in a lot of translations it says he was a righteous man, or in the, the, the Greek it's a, tz, I can't even say it, tzedek, T-S-D-E-K. Um, he was a righteous man. He did not want to expose her to public disgrace, and he had my, in mind to divorce her quietly. Okay, Before the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph, he was going to do his best to cause the least amount of hurt and drama in this situation. His, his goal and his plan was to bring restoration, not public condemnation. Joseph didn't want to publicly expose sin. And in John chapter 4, we see this in Jesus as well. You know, Joseph set the example. Now Jesus is following in his footsteps. And in John chapter 4, Jesus is meeting with the Samaritan woman at the well who's an adulterous woman. And he doesn't start dragging out her uh, dirty laundry in front of all of his disciples. No, he waits until his disciples go into town to fetch some food, and it's just him and this woman here. And, he, and then he confronts her, and what's the result of that gentle confrontation at the, at the well? Restoration and forgiveness. His heart the whole time is to restore what was broken. In Matthew chapter 18, Jesus again says, if someone sinned against you and they've caused a hurt in your life, you go directly to that person and you address that wound. You know the quickest way to heal um, from, from uh, someone sinning against you and there's a hurt in your life is to go directly to that person, talk to them about it, address the wound, and then to be quiet about it. Choose not to remember. The same way Jesus has forgiven us of our sins, he doesn't forget our sins, he chooses not to remember it. And so if you've been hurt this morning and, and there's just something, if you haven't addressed it, first you need to go to that person and address it. And second, if you have addressed it, choose not to remember it just as Jesus chooses not to remember your sins. We don't need to drag our best friend Jill into the situation. We don't need to, to drag our best friend Jim into the situation. They're not a part of the solution. You know what uh, is one of the most damaging and most hurtful things that can happen inside the walls of a church is Christian gossip. Christian gossip, what do I mean by that? Well, I just want to make you aware that so-and-so did this and that, and I, I just really wanted to make sure that you could just be praying for them. And, uh, and uh, you know, we, we, we expose these different things. If you're not a part of the solution, one of the things that we as pastors expect and this con congregation expects is that if you're not a part of the congregation, the <laughs> a little bit of Jim Carrey coming out of me. Um, if you are not a part of the solution, then just privately pray to God about that. 
You don't need to talk about it. You know, I, I, it's been a while ago, but someone came up to me and, and they were asking me, they said, uh, you know, how is so-and-so's wife? And, and I said, well, they've actually been divorced for about nine or ten years. You know, and I had to inform them that. And, and because this church does a good job most of the time of keeping your mouth shut and, and not dragging people through the mud, because you guys do a great job, people don't know each other's dirt. You understand that? Publi- or righteous people don't publicly expose sin. Teenagers, guys, uh, and young people, if you want to really stand out in your school, put an end to gossip. Just because something is true doesn't mean that it's worthy of being said. Just because it may have happened, you say, well, they, they were sinning out there for everybody else to see, so I'm just repeating it. They posted it on social media, or they did this, or they did that. Just because it's true doesn't mean you have to say it. Put an end to it. Just say, you know what, I don't need to hear about that. Or I'm going to choose to pray for them instead of talk about them. Real Christians don't ignore conviction from the Holy Spirit. And I believe that maybe God is pricking some of our hearts this morning that need to apologize to someone, that maybe need to put an end to their Christian chatter, that, that maybe uh, you know, a hurt has happened in your life and you've been talking to your husband about it and it's just still festering up inside you, but you just need to go to that individual and you need to address it the biblical way and go directly to that person and address that wound. And if that's you this morning, you, you need to respond to that conviction. You need to respond to the spirit prompting you to change. A righteous person doesn't expose sin publicly. The second thing we can learn from Joseph in this passage is that a righteous person hears from God. In this small portion of scripture, we see Joseph hearing from God three different times. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 20 and 21 says, But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Then again in chapter 2, verse 13, it says, When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Or maybe it was like, get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. And lastly, in verses 19 and 20 of chapter 2, after Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, get up, take the child and his mother and go back to the land of Israel. For those who are trying to take the child's life, are dead. Joseph heard from God. But scriptures also record that several times uh, Jesus would say to his disciples, the will of my father is this. The will of my father is that. How did Jesus know the will of his father? Well, Mark 1.35 says, that Jesus oftentimes would get up early before there were any distractions, before the kids were hungry and crying, and before, before your, uh, uh, whatever your routine was, and he would get up early, and he would go to a place of solitude, and he would spend time communing with the Father. We know that he knew the word of God. Listen, if you're trying to figure out what the will of God is, if you're trying to hear God's voice, and you're, you're, you're struggling to sort out your thoughts versus God's thoughts, start with the word of God, Right? Start with the, the word of God. Now, I already know what some of you are thinking. You know, for Joseph, it was easy. You know, he had this, the, the angel of the Lord appear to him. How many would think that would be awesome in life's tough decisions to say, hey, angel of the Lord, come and, and speak to me. Which job do I need to take, angel of the Lord? How many would be like, that's really nice, you know? Or, or uh, I can see this, you know, you just finished eating a nice meal and the waiter comes forward and he's like, would you like cheesecake or creme brulee? And you're like, ooh, that is tough. Let me, let me console with this, the angel of the Lord and he can give me wisdom in this situation because that is difficult, right? Um, you know, but I think we overcomplicate things because we get so, I don't know, consumed with, with is God speaking to me or, or is it just me? And you know, the best way to know that is to know your Bible. Use the Bible as a litmus test. Is what you're hearing, is what you're feeling led to do, does it align with God's word or does it contradict God's word? If it doesn't contradict God's word, then likely it's good, right? 
The more time you spend in God's word, the more you'll start to think his thoughts and the easier it will be to know which thoughts are from God and which thoughts are from our own fleshly desires. Righteous people take time to listen and to hear God. Let me ask you this. When was the last time that you just took five or 10 minutes with no distractions, just you and God, and you just listened to God? You know, it'd probably be more effective today than me speaking and me regurgitating things that I've studied. You know, probably be the most effective thing that I could do today is just, if I was just to be quiet for the next 10 minutes and we're just to close our eyes and just listen to what God had to say. When was the last time in your your car you just shut off all the music and you're just led by the Spirit? Or maybe, you know, yesterday morning I was headed to a breakfast appointment at 7.30 and the sky was absolutely beautiful and that just spoke to me so much that, that God created that and he loves me. When was the last time we just tuned out and we just turned off everything so that we could hear God. Righteous people hear God. But what's awesome about Joseph and Jesus isn't so much that they heard God. After all, I believe that everyone here can hear God. But what really sets them apart was their obedience to God. All three times that we see in this scripture that Joseph heard from the Lord, uh, uh, of from the Lord, obedience followed. He packed his bags and he headed for Egypt. Think with me for a minute how difficult that might have been. Joseph had just prepared or was in the process of preparing a home for Mary. Okay, we talked several weeks ago about the insulas where the little rooms on the houses that you would add on to or in some people's cases they didn't have family and they would just completely build a new house and Joseph has been putting all this time and this energy and this, this um, attention into preparing this home for, for Mary and, and in his intentions, you know, he's, he's wanting to stay close to his family. He wants to stay close to his trade and his job. He's well known. He's well respected. But Jesus says, get up and go. And, and, or or the, the, the angel of the Lord says, get up and, and go. And what does Joseph do? He obeys. And that causes him and his family to leave uh, his, his relatives, his job, and his position. His obedience to the Lord led him to starting over. I think someone in this room really needs to hear this. Sometimes the future that we prepare for is not the future that God has in mind for you. Sometimes the future plans that that we start to kind of, oh yeah, I can map this out and I can map that out. Maybe that's not what God really wants. We make a lot of decisions that are based on what we think is best for our family rather than what God thinks is best for our family. Are you willing to be like Joseph and leave your relatives, your job, and your position? You know, oftentimes American Christians can relate to the rich young ruler who lived by the law of God, but when Jesus asked him to sell all of his belongings, he went away sad. Now, I'm not saying that you can't have nice things. I believe that nice things can be a blessing. I have a nice home, but I try to use my home as a blessing to people, okay? But if God were to call me away from my home and my comfort, and he were to call me to a a one-bedroom, 300-square-foot apartment in Uganda or wherever it would be, could I walk away from those things? If God were to call you away from your relatives, from your family, from your loved ones, from your, your position, would you be able to obey God? If God opened up a door of a job that was less pain, hear me, if it was less pain, but you knew that God was in it and you knew that you were supposed to take it, would you change your standard of living and possibly downsize in order to be in the center of God's will? Man, Joseph leaves us a a great example of, of how to be obedient, but Jesus is the perfect example. Every time Jesus says the will of my father, there's obedience that follows. In the garden of Gethsemane, he prays this, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. Jesus was so obedient that it led him to a death on the cross for you and I, so that we could have salvation, so that someday we can go to heaven with him. Obedience is the proof of our love to God. Obedience is the proof of your love to your God. If you feel in your heart that there's some ministry that's missing here at New Hope, then God might be calling you to do something about it. If you see the need, 
then God has opened your eyes and nudged your heart, not so that you can tell someone else to meet the need, but so that you would meet the need. It's unlikely that God reveals a need in your life or a need around the world and opens your eyes to it so you can tell someone else to do it. As God speaks, we must obey. Righteous people don't just hear, they obey. And until we live in complete obedience, our lives will be restless. Obedience brings peace. John 14, Jesus says, if you love me, you will obey. But here's the cool thing is, you know, that, that sounds really daunting, like, oh my gosh, I, I, I have to just do this all on myself. But no, no, Jesus has sent the Holy Spirit so that it would come inside of our hearts so that we can obey. You know, it, when, when we're presented with opportunities, um, you know, to, to disobey or to obey, it's as simple as just saying, God, I need your spirit. I can't make this decision in my own flesh because my flesh is selfish. I can't write this check in my own flesh because I, I want this or because it doesn't make sense logically. But that's where God's spirit steps in and allows us to be obedient. A righteous person doesn't publicly expose sin. They hear from God and they're obedient to what they hear and lastly, they are a student of God's word. Luke chapter two says, every year Joseph and his family went to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. This was the story when Jesus accidentally got left behind. You guys remember that? You know, Joseph and Mary and Jesus, and I'm sure a lot of other people traveled to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. And, and uh, three days later, Joseph and Mary are like, we don't know where Jesus is. So they go back and they try to find their son. They look all over the city. Um, and where do they find him? In the temple, doing what? Discussing scriptures. And who, were, who was impressed? The rabbis. The rabbis were amazed at all of his knowledge. They were amazed at how much wisdom he had from the word of God. Now, I don't believe that Jesus just woke up someday and he just knew all the scriptures. I believe that Joseph played a big role in teaching Jesus the scriptures and the memory verses. It was very custom in that day and age to uh, spend multiple nights a week in the synagogues reading and discussing the scriptures. I wonder how much more successful our children, how much more successful we would be in making the correct decisions and making godly decisions if, if we spent as much time discussing God's word and reading God's word as we do practicing sports or doing dramas or, or uh, dance or whatever it might be. What would our life, what would this church look like if we really dug into the word of God? If you don't have a desire to come to church, it's likely because you aren't spending time in God's word. Because there, the more time you spend in God's word, the hungrier you become to spiritual things. Wednesday nights become something you enjoy and partake in. Sunday school is something you value. Sunday nights aren't just for the old fogies that don't have anything else going on. Sunday nights are, are, are the nights where I get to be in the presence of God, where I get to discuss scripture with my brothers and sisters in Christ. Sunday nights are the nights where I get to pray one-on-one -on -one with my kids because right now there's someone else praying for my kid in the two-year-olds and the three-year-olds, but I don't get to do that up here on the altar. That's what Sunday nights are for. Righteous people value and study the word of God. When you start digesting God's word daily, you'll begin to crave it. And we know that Jesus knew uh, the word of God because when in Luke chapter 4, when he was full of the Holy Spirit and he was led by the Holy Spirit and Satan starts throwing all these attacks and all these temptations at Jesus, what does Jesus do? He runs the other way. He runs from temptation. You know, that's what some of you guys do. That's sometimes what I do. It's like, you know what, instead of um, facing temptation square in the face. We just decide, oh, I don't want to be around that person. I won't go to that place. I won't do that thing. And so I'm just going to remove myself, which is effective. But what did Jesus do? He doesn't run from temptation. He stands up to it and he starts spitting all these scriptures at him. He says, yes, but it is written. It is written. It is written. And he completely destroys Satan and that temptation. Psalms 119.11, I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you, right? When was the last time you spent time being a student of God's word? 
diving into it. Righteous people study the word of God. Would the musicians come and, and as they do, would you all stand with me? And as you stand, I just want you to put away any distractions, whether that's your phone, your notes. You can't put away your spouse, I'm sorry. But would you just close your eyes? And I believe that the Holy Spirit is speaking to all of us this morning. I believe that, you know, it might not be an audible voice. It might not be this, this you know, sh- earth-shaking uh, moment where God's voice just comes in and says, Steve, or, or whoever it is, you know. But I do believe that God's gentle, soft, compassionate, restorative voice is speaking to you this morning. So close your eyes. Allow God to begin to speak to you. For some, God might be speaking that, and you need to repent or you need to change. Maybe you need to address a wound that you ha- you've done a good job not talking about, but the wound was never addressed with. May- maybe he's speaking ideas of how to spend more time in God's presence. Maybe he's just simply telling you this morning that he loves you. What is God speaking to you this morning? In just a moment, I'm gonna invite anyone that would like prayer to come forward to the altar area. Maybe you need healing physically, emotionally, relationally, or spiritually. Maybe one of these sermon points has convicted you and you feel the need to come forward. Maybe you just wanna come forward as a way of saying, God, I'm coming after you. In just a moment, the altars will be open and a place of seeking God in prayer will be available. So be ready to come forward. But with with eyes closed, heads bowed, out of respect for your neighbors, I just want to make sure that there's no one here that they'd say, Austin, if I were to die today, I I don't think I would make heaven. And I need Jesus to be the center of it all. I need Jesus to come into my heart, to forgive me of my sins, to fill me with his Holy Spirit so that I can live a victorious, righteous life. If if you're here this morning, you say for the first time in your life, Austin, I need to ask Jesus into my life. I need him to save me. Would you raise your hand so that I can pray for you? Is there anyone here? Yes, I see you. Yes. Yes. Who else? Is there anyone else saying, Jesus, I need you. God, I thank you for these two hands, Lord. I pray right now that your grace would minister to them. God, that you would forgive them and they would would feel no guilt or condemnation in your name, Jesus. That you would enter their hearts and give them the power to live victorious and live righteous, God. We repent of our sins, we turn from our sins, and we turn to you, and we set our eyes, our affection on you. So forgive us, heal us, make us whole this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. The altars are open for whatever type of prayer you need. It's not weird, it's not unnatural, it's biblical to pray for one another. So if you need prayer or you just want to seek God, I just want to encourage you. We've got, we've got plenty of time, guys. We've got plenty of times. We're in no hurry. We're in zero hurry. Lunch will be there. So let's just seek God right now.